Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. How many of you know what this is? This graph, specifically this point on this graph, is the point at which Facebook knows that you have begun your next relationship. Whether or not you've explicitly told Facebook that you've begun your next relationship by setting your relationship status. So how does Facebook know this? They know because of these little black dots. Those little black dots are the number of timeline posts between you and another person. And the horizontal axis is days, specifically 100 days leading up to when your relationship status actually changes. So what interests me about this is, when does Facebook know that you're going to start a new relationship within those 100 days? Is it possibly before you know? And <laughs> perhaps a more important question, who owns this intelligence? Who owns this data? Now, Facebook released this study as part of a blog post, and there were comments on it, and somebody asked this question, is this anonymized data available? And Facebook said, we're sorry, we don't even release anonymized data. It's strictly for our use. So the answer to who owns this data, of course, here is Facebook. So I don't know if you've been following Facebook at all recently, but they just bought a messaging application called WhatsApp for $19 billion. Why was WhatsApp worth $19 billion to Facebook? Well, it's quite simple. What they bought were the mobile phone numbers of 450 million people, but more importantly, the right to eavesdrop on all of their future conversations, should they desire. So you might say, well, OK, so what? Right, Aral, it's fine, it's a product, if we don't like it, we don't have to use it, it's not like these things are essential. Well, I beg to differ. To understand why this is so important, we have to evaluate how our, our relationship to technology has evolved over the last 30 to 40 years. Now, computers once were these external, cold, impersonal devices that filled up entire rooms, and we had to actually drive to one if we wanted to use it. Today, that couldn't be further from the truth. We wear them on our persons. They can't get more personal than that. We wake up with our mobile phones, we go to bed with our mobile phones. That's very personal. Whereas computers once were disconnected from the world around them, disconnected from one another, and unaware of the world itself. Today, they are always on. They're always seeing. They're always hearing. They have a plethora of sensors by which they can feel the world around them and are aware of the world around them. So today, it's not too much of a stretch to say that we are cyborgs. Not in that we actually embed ourselves with technology necessarily, but in that we extend our biological capabilities via technologies. These technologies are what we use to both experience and manipulate the world around ourselves. And whether or not these technologies work well or not, well, that's really important because they are essential to our lives. And when they work well, they empower us, when they don't work so well, they enfeeble us. So the question then becomes, who owns these tools? And today, that answer is a handful of companies. Apple, Facebook, Google, Twitter. And what's common with these companies is that they're all closed silos. And a subset of these companies also share a business model, the business model of free. So what? Free's fine. I love free, right? What could possibly be wrong with free? Well, if some of you are thinking this way, I, I, you're going to love this new startup that I'm going to tell you about right now. It's called Schnail Mail. 
and I am very excited about snail mail because we have solved a very important problem. We have solved the problem of real mail. That's right. Snail mail will give you free real mail forever. You can send as many letters as you want, as many packages as you want, to as many people as you want around the world, free forever. Who thinks this is a great idea? Who would use this? Who would use snail mail? Yeah, some of you feel it coming, right? They're like, there's a catch here. <laughs> well, there is a catch. And the catch is that we do read your letters. We do open your, and we do read them, but we only do this so that we can give you helpful hints and suggestions based on what we've read. It may be correct or not. We're trying to understand what you're saying. Um, but don't worry, because we will put all of this back in the envelope, and you wouldn't even know that we were here. So who'd still use this? Is there there's usually one, there we go, there's always one person. It's free, I'll use it. For the rest of you, you use Gmail, right? Now, there may not be a person there reading each one of your letters, but there is an algorithm, there is a computer. So that's snail mail, that's snailmail.com. Do tell your friends, I think it's gonna be big, I'm really excited about this. So why does Google do this? Are they evil? Is there a conspiracy theory? No. You don't need conspiracy theories when you have the simplicity of business models. It is simply their business model to monetize data. Therefore, just like the mutant plant from outer space from the musical Little Shop of Horrors, Audrey II, who starts out as a little sapling that needs just drops of blood and then ends up eating whole people, Google needs your data to grow. It's just their business model. And how do they get your data? Via a variety of ways. One being services. So remember that Google also started out as a sapling, right? They just started out as a search engine. That's all they did, right? They weren't even tracking you back then. They stumbled onto their business model. But today's Google is a very different beast. It's a plethora of services. Do you want a place to put all of your files? Please put them on Google Drive. Of course, Google will look through all of your files to try and understand you better, to try and get to know you better. Um, do you have pictures that you've taken? Put, put them on Picasa. Of course, Google will be analyzing who's in those pictures. So again, try and get to know you better. And the same with if you want to keep in touch with your friends, use Google+. Plus. They have your social graph. Use Google Hangouts and Google Chat, and they can see what you're saying to your friends. We mentioned Google Mail at the beginning. Now, with Google Mail, some of you might also say, well, you know, Aral, it's our decision, right? <laughs> You know, I'm not hurting anyone else here. Uh, I can choose to accept the terms of this relationship that Google presents for me and use it. But it's not exactly that. Because take Google Mail, right? You might say, I'm okay with Google knowing the contents of the letters that I write, right, the emails that I write. What about the people who email you? Now, if you're using a custom domain, they may not even know that Google is going to be reading what they've written. They've never given consent for that. So in that way, it's a lot like smoking and secondhand cigarette smoke. It also affects other people. So how else do they get data? Well, they have games. ReCAPTCHA. Who's used the ReCAPTCHA on a form, on an online form here? Yes, yeah, some of you? OK, awesome. And it's great, right? It's very useful. It protects the form, but there are two words, and they're very open about it. They say, you know, help us to read the books that we've digitized by telling us what this second word that we don't know is, and we know the first word so that we can prove that you're human and we can protect this form that way. That's nice. Sometimes they have actual games. Ingress is a free game from Google that you can download and you can play. And the way you play it is you run around town and try to find monuments and then hack into them with this game. Uh, and, and what you're really doing, though, as you're playing this fun, free game, is you're giving Google very hard-to-come-by data on pedestrian walking patterns. So when I think of this, I think of rats in a maze, as we would in a laboratory. Let's just put them out there, see what they do, and study them, right? Um, but OK, so maybe Google services are not for you, and you can say, I'm not going to use this. And for a company that needs your data, they've lost right at that point, so they can't let it stop there. What's the next step? We can give you devices. 
We can give you beautiful, beautiful devices like these Nexus phones. Have you seen them? They're a really great experience. They really are. Google understands user experience now. And they're half the price of an iPhone. How amazing is that? I mean, does Google have twice the economies of scale of Apple? You know, Tim Cook is meant to be a supply chain guy. Is he asleep at the helm? No. These are subsidized devices. What these are are beautiful, gorgeous experiences, beautiful, gorgeous data entry devices that Google says, here, take these and give us your data, right? The same with their tablets, the same with their Chromebooks. What they've done here is they've made your sign-in to your device your Google username and password. So at that point, it doesn't matter what service you use, they will still get some data, and that's how they make money. So it makes perfect sense. And they're not, again, doing this because there is some conspiracy, but it is the goal of experience design, as I see it, to create the experience machine. Now, this is a theoretical device that I've come up with to explain where we want to be ideally. The experience machine is a machine that knows everything about the world, it knows everything about you, and it can read your mind. If we could get to this point, we could all go home as designers, right? So, everything about you, we know how Google tries to get that information via its services, devices. Read your mind, that is what the uh, ultimate aim is as designers. We want to know what you, what you want to do before you want to know it. In fact, Amit Singhal, who is head of search at Google, said, I want my search engine to be the expert who knows me the best. It needs to know you so well that sometimes you don't need to ask it the next question. Right? This is the goal that we have, and to know everything about the world. Right? So what, what, what is there? There's Google Earth. Right? Google Earth is great satellite imagery. There's Google Maps. That's, that's really awesome. Google Street View, right? It's not always up to date, as I found last night, um, but really great. And, and the Street View cars, who's seen the Street View car going through? So that's Google trying to get more information about the Earth. And there's some places that the Street View car can't go, so there's the Street View trike. And, and there are places where the Street View trike can't go, but Google needs data, so there is the Street View snowmobile. <laughs> and but there are internal spaces. So there is the street view trolley for museums, etc. And finally, if they can't get there with a trolley, there is a street view backpack. So the one place, though, that they can't go is your home, right? Or your workplace. Even if they have one of these backpacks on with this strange thing protruding from it, or quite possibly because of that, um, you probably won't let them into your home. So, that's why they need you, right? How many of you have heard of Google's latest project, Project Tango? Project Tango is a new phone. And what Project Tango does is it has depth sensors and motion tracking camera, and it maps the interior spaces around you as you're walking around with this phone so that Google can actually see inside the interior spaces that you're walking in and recognize objects in it, etc. So basically, again, because they can't get into your home and into your businesses, it's so much easier for you to with their fancy toy, right? Why? Again, not a huge conspiracy. They just need as much data as they can get. That's how they make money. It's very, very, very simple. So they have services, and they have devices, right? So what is the next step, though? Because you can say, well, my, my gosh, all right, all, I'm not going to use their devices. And then they've lost. What's the third step? What is the end game if your business model is monetizing data? The end game is connectivity. So if they can make your sign-in to the internet your Google sign-in, then no matter what device you use, they can get valuable data, right? They're not cut off entirely. That's exactly what they're trying to do with Google Fiber, currently in Kansas and the US. But what about the next five billion? We keep hearing about the next five billion, and these poor, poor souls apparently just really need to get on the internet. This is the only problem they have, and these Silicon Valley companies are just trying so hard to be the ones that get them connected to the internet and, and really save them. Uh, what about them? Well, for them, Google has Google Loon. They're going to give them internet access with balloons. So in the future, there might actually be a whole nation whose notion of the internet is something you sign into with your Google username and password. And of course, Facebook's trying to do the same thing with internet.org. So 
just like Audrey too, from the little shop of horrors who, need, who needs blood to grow, these free services need your data to grow. They are not necessarily evil or there is no conspiracy theory, but they spy on you because it is their business model to spy on you, right? The business model of free is the business model of corporate surveillance. So you might have heard the saying, if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product being sold. Well, in this case, I prefer you are the quarry being mined. You are the livestock being farmed. And really, it's not even about your data. Your data is just raw materials. That's what's being mined. It's raw materials for something that's way more valuable, for your profile, for the virtual you, the digital self, the simulation of you, your sim that these companies create to understand more about you. Why? Because I can't take you and I can't put you in a lab and prod you. There are laws against that, to see how you react to things, to see what your fears are, your ambitions are, right? I can't do that right now, because your corporeal self has rights. But if I can simulate you, if I can have enough information about you that I can build a simulation of you, I can put that simulation in a lab, and I can prod it, and I can psychoanalyze it, and I can study it all I want using whatever techniques I, I want, because your simulation has no rights under the law today. So that's one of the things that we need to change. We need, this is not just a technical issue, this is also a matter of legislation. Um, you might say, Aral, you know what, so what? I'm okay with all of this, and you know what? If I set my privacy settings on there to private, then they don't share anything. It's fine, I'm okay with it. Not really. Ever since 9-11, things have been different. After 9-11, in the United States, they formed the Information Awareness Office. This is the actual logo, right? Um, and its goal was to achieve total information awareness. Now, if that's your goal, right, do not make this your logo. <laughs> People get scared. You know, a pyramid with an all-seeing eye shooting lasers at the world. Don't do that. So people got scared, and they said, oh, sorry, no, we won't do that anymore. But, of course, if you've been following the Snowden leaks from last year, they didn't stop this program. And if you've been following, you also know that the NSA really needs to hire a PowerPoint designer. Um, <laughs> but, well, there is one thing about this slide that we do have to appreciate. Microsoft was first at something, and that doesn't happen every day. So, um, credit where credit is due. Uh, so what were they sharing? <laughs> what were they sharing? Everything, everything that we thought we had set to private was being shared. Why? Because it's so much easier for governments to ask these third-party services for data that you have volunteered to them because it's not under the same protections under the law, right? As Bruce Schneier, the security expert and cryptographer says, the NSA didn't wake up and say, hey, let's just spy on everybody. They looked up and they said, the corporations are spying on everyone, let's get in on the game. Right? So if this is the case, I'm sure that the people who run Google and run Facebook are really concerned about this, right? And they want to they make something, they, they want to do something about it. So let's hear from Eric Schmidt, who is ex-CEO and current executive chairman of Google. What does he think about this stuff? He says, there's been surveillance for years. I'm not going to pass judgment on that. It's the nature of our society. But Eric, what should we do? If you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Or maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. If you have something you don't want everyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Why didn't I think of this, right? Now, um, I, you know, Eric is actually a stand-up guy. 
right? He didn't just say this. He wanted to prove to the world that this was true. So he went out and he created some websites and he put up his own images and videos. And some of my favorites are ericstoiletantics.com. Interesting videos there. Um, and then there's Eric's favorite sexytimes.com. Some very interesting pictures and videos. My favorite is ericsmasturbationadventures.com. Now, these websites don't exist, and nor should they, because privacy has nothing to do with whether or not you have something to hide. Privacy is about having control over what you share and what you keep to yourself. If we make the default public, then anything that is private has an association of guilt attached to it. That is a place we don't want to go. Privacy is a fundamental human right for a reason, of a human right, furthermore, that we've enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 12, to be precise. And it is a prerequisite, an essential prerequisite for civil liberties and for human rights. So with their business models, these purveyors of corporate surveillance are emerging as a great threat to our fundamental freedoms. So free is a lie, but maybe it's more than that. It is a lie because it is a concealed barter. We are actually giving something quite valuable away. It is a con, a confidence trick by its very definition, an act of cheating or tricking somebody by gaining their trust and persuading them to believe something that is not true. In fact, just two days ago, Michael Novak, product manager at Facebook, said, now we're thinking about privacy as a set of experiences that help people feel comfortable. Comfortable with what, you might ask? Comfortable with the fact that they don't truly have privacy. A con. And although you might have a choice in the products that you use today, you do not necessarily on the internet today have a choice of business models because there is a monopoly of business models. This business model is emerging as a monopoly. And it's leading us down a path that I call digital feudalism. Digital feudalism is a future where you cannot own, you do not even have the option of owning your own tools and data, but you must rent them from corporations. So that's the problem. If you want to learn more about the problem, there's a great documentary called Terms and Conditions May Apply that came out last year. I believe it's available on iTunes and on Netflix. Do watch it. It's non-technical and it's very accessible. But that's the problem. If we leave it there, that is a very depressing place to leave it. Thanks, Saral. Uh, not happy with the world right now. So what is the alternative? The alternative, of course, is open. Right? And open is easy, free and open. Why aren't you all using free and open tools? I don't know, it's so easy. I will take you through it in three steps. Okay, it's very, very easy. One, you clone the Git repository of a Google and Facebook alternative. You're all with me, right? Uh, right? And then, and then number two, you configure and deploy it to your own server. We all do this, right? You, probably, you were probably doing this last night. Yeah, configuring, to, yeah? And then three, you just ask all of your friends to do the same thing. It's not easy. And that's the greatest problem we have in the free and open world. Even though the source code for something might be open, it can be closed to certain audiences. It can be inaccessible to certain people. To whom? Non-enthusiasts. And the problem is user experience. Let me give you an example. Firefox OS, by the darling of the free and open world, Mozilla, right? It's a mobile operating system. So when I heard about this, I was, I was psyched. I'm like, yes, let's try it out. I bought the pre-production version, the production version. I lived with it for a week. This is how you should be evaluating technologies, not on ideology, not on feature lists. Live with them for a week. Do they empower you or do they enfeeble you? And this was its hello. It said, set the date for me. That's rude, right, isn't it? I mean, if I just met you and I said, hey, set the date for me, you'd be like, that's quite rude. What happened to hello? And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, nobody probably bought this phone in 1980. <laughs> so why are you making me go through 30 years just to set the date? Why is that your hello to begin with? 
right? This was a valid error message. Until I realized this, because a friend told me, I reinstalled the operating system twice because I thought, no way that this is a valid error message. This was the opening screen of the Maps app. If you can't read what it says, that's okay. Neither could I. This is the Maps app itself. It had a button on it that I've never been able to hit. It became a casual game. Whenever I was bored, I would try to hit the button. I regret to inform it was a game that I never actually successfully completed. This was me sending a direct message to my girlfriend on Twitter. If you can't see what I'm writing, that's okay. Neither could I. The keyboard is covering it. And worst of all, this was what the Train Times website looked like on it. It didn't work, which meant that I didn't know that every train at London Bridge Station had been cancelled that evening, and it meant that I got back to my home in Brighton and to my girlfriend and to my dog two hours later than I should have. And this is the effect that the things that we make as designers have. They either empower people or they can rob them of the thing that they have the least of, experiences, time. Our lives are a string of experiences. If you think about them as grains of sand in an hourglass, we only have a finite set. And whether we have these experiences with other people or the products and the objects that we create, it is that same hourglass and the same grains of sand. And we have a profound responsibility as designers to not take that for granted. And that's what it did. That's not my only gripe with Mozilla, of course. They're also, they get 90% of their revenue from guess who? Google. So again, we're back to that. And another issue that I have with them and with open and free in general is that they saw nothing wrong with electing a CEO who acted, actually acted to deny certain people equal rights. And they couldn't see what the problem was until he actually decided to resign himself. These are not problems we're going, that are going to be solved by middle-aged white men alone. We need diversity in this community. So Mozilla and Firefox OS are not the answer. Our revolution will not be sponsored by those that we're revolting against. And the traditional open source and free organizations are just not equipped to handle the problems that we're facing in the post-Snowden era. Because the solutions we need are consumer solutions. This battle is a battle we're going to fight in the consumer market. This battle for our privacy. And Free and open source today cannot compete because it is features-led. It is living in that past era where features were important. There was a time when features were important. The difference between your CPU being uh, a certain speed or twice that speed might have meant the difference between being able to go to the moon or not being able to go to the moon. In that case, who cares how hard it is to use that device? You're going to learn it and you're going to use it because the only alternative is not doing what you want to do. Today, in the consumer market, we have feature parity among products. That is no longer the case. User experience is what differentiates products. So today, free and open source are an, a sandbox for enthusiasts. There's nothing wrong with that. It's great to play. It's great to experiment. But we can't harbor under this notion, this theory of trickle-down technology, as I call it, which is akin to trickle-down economics, which for those of you who may not know, says that if we empower the hugely wealthy to become hugely wealthier, somehow, some of that extra wealth will also trickle down to other people who need it. Now, this is big in the States, where if you look at the statistics, 1% of the population owns 40% of the wealth. So there are still a lot of people there who are waiting for things to trickle down. And we have the same assumptions in technology. Trickle-down technology says, well, if we have enthusiasts who are working to create tools for other enthusiasts, somehow these will also trickle down into being usable products for consumers. And it doesn't work. This is why we've given people personal computers for 30 years when apparently all they wanted were iPhones. And worse than that, we told them that they were too dumb to use them when we were too dumb to create simple enough solutions. It's about user experience. Who gets user experience today? Apple does, Google does when they're making their own products, forget about Android in general, right? And what's common between these two companies? Control. Control over all aspects of what they're doing, what's going into the product, hardware, software, services, soon connectivity. Because it is the combination of these components that is the experience. 
And although we may, as the makers, be able to split them up and dissect them and examine each individually, people do not when they're using it. They either have a great experience or they don't. They either love it or they don't. So the age of features is dead. We're living in the age of experiences. One of the companies that makes one of these remotes understands that. And you can see it. You can see it because the appearance of that remote is a symptom of this understanding. So we need to create a new category of technology, a new category of free and open technology. It needs to have experience-driven products. In order to create these, we need to create design-led organizations because without these organizations, we cannot create these products. We must design the organization before we can design the product. Because design is not something that bubbles up. Design has to come from the top down, or else it doesn't work. Because design is about budgets, design is about development processes. Great design is not what great designers do. Great design is a symptom of a design-led organizational structure and development processes. So today, in the closed world, of course we have features-driven clothes. The Nokias and the Microsofts of the world, mediocrity is the norm, but we also have experience-driven clothes. In the open world, we only have features-driven open. We're missing a whole quadrant of technology, the quadrant of experience-driven open. So you might say, all right, so what? Why is this important? This quadrant of technology, whole quadrant that we're missing, is essential, a prerequisite to empowering people to own their own data and their own tools. If you look at a map of the internet today, it is dominated by the closed silos. And it might be a better state of affairs than the centralized world that we were living in previously to it, but it is still only decentralized. And decentralized doesn't necessarily mean what you might think it means. Decentralized doesn't mean that it doesn't have centers. It means it has numerous centers. What we need to do is to evolve the web to its next configuration, which is a distributed configuration. In a distributed configuration, all of the nodes can connect to each other. There are no centers. So what will those nodes be? Well, they might be personal clouds, but a personal cloud is, again, a solution for enthusiasts. No one's going to install a personal cloud server. No, these nodes have to be consumer devices, whether those are phones, whether those are tablets, or something else altogether. And of course, these devices will have operating systems, but working on just an operating system is, again, a toy for enthusiasts. What these consumer devices have to do is seamlessly include the cloud, the operating system, into a beautiful experience, if we are to compete. This is what I call independent technology, or indie technology for short. Indie tech are beautifully designed, easy to use, free and open source consumer products that empower people to own their own tools and data. And today, for the first time here, I'm launching the draft of the Indie Tech Manifesto. You can find it right now at indietech.org. And the core elements of this are, one, that these products are design-led. Two, that they are free and open. Three, that they are independent. If you go to the manifesto, you will be able to find more information about each one of these points. And I'm not just talking about this either. I'm doing something about it. We are actually building an operating system in the OS. We are actually building a personal cloud in the cloud. But these by themselves are worthless. These will not solve the problem. We need a third thing, a third thing that beautifully, seamlessly integrates these two. And that's why we've undertaken the audacious task of actually building a phone, Indie phone. So you might say, why? Why are you doing this? I'm not a masochist, that's for sure. I know how hard it is to make a phone. Why am I taking on some of the largest companies in the world? Why? Because I want this phone to exist. I want to live in a world where alternatives like this phone and other alternatives exist. Because 
The difference between a world where we have these alternatives and one where we don't is the difference between a world where we don't have civil liberties and human rights and one in which we do. One in which we have the tools we need to safeguard our privacy, our civil liberties, and our human rights. So yes, free is a lie. The cost of free is our privacy. The cost of free is our civil liberties. The cost of free are our human rights. The cost of free is a price that is just too high for us to pay.